Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for that introduction and for inviting me here. And also thank you for everyone who uh, joined to listen. Um, and and uh, like uh, Matt said, I'm, I'm presenting work for my master's degree. And um, on top of being um, doing this research, I'm also a dancer and a movement teacher. And this will kind of uh, blend in to my talk today. So uh, I did work on analogies in motor learning. And this is something that is um, used very often in the dance world when we teach children or athletes to move in sports, in uh, martial arts. And so before I talk about my research, I would just like to present some of the ways that analogies are used in the real world in this kind of motor context. Um, and specifically in dance, which is my background. So first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the work of Eric Franklin. He's a Swiss dancer and dance educator. And he uh, works a lot with analogies, which he calls uh, imagery or mental imagery. And uh, so for everyone here, I just want you to kind of take your um, attention to your upper body and uh, like your neck, your shoulders, your ribs. And I will present an analogy here that usually he gives verbally, but I took some images from his website. So you can kind of imagine that there are two balloons attached to your clavicles and they are very gently pulling them up and feel what is happening in your body when you think about this kind of image. Uh, it might be very subtle, nothing huge needs to happen, but it does ev evoke some feeling, at least for me. Uh, another image he kind of uses is this uh, smaller balloon that floated up your spine and has stopped exactly where your um, highest vertebra meets the skull. And it's kind of gently pushing the skull up so you can also feel what this uh, image does in your own body. Maybe it helps the jaw to release down and kind of the skull is continuing to move up. And I have here a, a final image from his website. And of course, I am not affiliated with Eric Franklin, but you can learn more on his website. Uh, this image of a water fountain or a geyser that is kind of uh, flowing up the spine and ending just beneath the skull, again, pushing it upwards. These are a very kind of a vivid analogies. And um, I just think it's interesting to know how uh, things that we research in our labs or in, in academic research are used in the real world. And I would like to share another example. And this is a video, so I'm sharing it with sound. So my next example is a, a choreographer named Ohad Naharin. He is based in Israel. Um, and I'll just show you a video how he works with his analogies. So hopefully this video works. And if it doesn't, kind of tell me. Let's connect into a shake. A shake is something that they do, they want to do. They shake because they decide. And now let's connect to quake. Quake is something that happened to them. Again, shake. They shake. They decide to shake. And quake again. And that's what happened. It's like a little bit like being in an earthquake or a body quake. It's an, it's an event that happens beyond our control. It happened to us. So many times... And go back to what you were doing, like connect to the form and stuff. All right. So that was a bit of a taste uh, of his work. And now I'm going to go back to our research. Uh, I was doing my master's in Jason Friedman's lab for motor learning. And uh, I would like to talk first about like, um, I was a dancer and I was interested in this. And I went to see what is going on in the scientific literature. So when I went there, I saw that uh, the way analogies are defined and how they are used is as following. 
um, analogies combine task relevant rules into a single biomechanical metaphor. So I know that a lot of people here uh, do different work with analogies and probably for each context, they are defined a bit differently. And this is how usually they are defined in the motor learning uh, research context. Uh, and there's a lot of things going on in this definition. Um, so I would just like to highlight that the idea is using a single metaphor as opposed to a list of task relevant rules which maybe when I am a coach or a teacher and I want to teach a new skill, I would give this long list of all the things I would like my dancers or athletes to do. And going back to Eric Franklin, we can think that instead of giving this image or the analogy of a balloon, he would start telling us to move C1 vertebrae 30 degrees front and C2 vertebrae Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, like giving very detailed mechanical um, instructions. So instead of this, we give one single metaphor. This is the general idea. Um, so when when I looked at the scientific uh, research, indeed, this type of uh, method analogies do uh, Im improve task outcomes. And this has been shown for a variety of uh, experiments for different groups, starting from uh, preschool children uh, until older adults and naive participants or kind of an amateur athletes. For all these groups, analogies improve their task outcomes. And uh, I also saw research on different sports. So basketball, tennis, golf, jumping, um, anything you can imagine, someone has done an analogy study about it and analogies improve their outcomes. So I just want to give a, a final example from a scientific uh, study where um, the task in the experiment was throwing a basketball into a hoop. And basically they measured how many times participants were able to uh, get the basketball through the hoop and the analogies they used, this is a study from 2009, they told participants to imagine that they are reaching with their hands into a cookie jar on the top shelf. This was the analogy given. And the idea is that this motion of reaching into a cookie jar is what will help them to uh, throw the basketball more accurately. And indeed it did. Um, so all this was very interesting to me and I was happy to learn it. And when I was talking with uh, Jason and the way he does research, um, we, we decided to see how um, these analogies actually affect the movement of participants. So in all the studies that I saw, um, the researchers only uh, measured task outcomes. How many times does the basketball go through the hoop? And we were interested in uh, understanding what actually changes in the bodies and in the movement of the participants, recording their movement throughout the task and seeing what differences are there. Um, so this is pretty much our research question. Uh, can analogies improve movement kinematics? And what, what are they improving? Okay. So hopefully uh, this was a lot of information, but you're still with me. And now I'll talk about our research and what we did. So um, in order to actually measure participants' movements, we needed a simple task that we can record throughout. We started with this, the target task, that is quite similar to a drawing task. And we asked participants to connect the dots going uh, according to order. So from A to B to C to D and back to A, closing a shape. And you can try out now on your own screens at home without like getting grease on the screen, but uh, try to connect the dots or in your mind and figure out how you would do it or try to remember what is your strategy. And basically participants were asked to do this to uh, connect the dots and close a shape as quickly and accurately as possible. Um, and just, I want to um, take a bit of time on this task and, and like explain maybe why it's even interesting 
to use this task, which might seem mundane and very obvious, like making a four line shape is not that, uh, I don't know, demanding. But what we were interested in is the idea of movement primitives, um, which the way we thought about them kind of help us to gain insight into the mental representations. So what are participants thinking? How do they represent this task and the movement that they are doing? And in general, a movement primitive, the way we defined it is um, that participants make a straight path with a single peaked bell-shaped velocity profile. What does that mean? Participants are drawing a line from A to B. This is like the beginning of the task, the first movement. And when we look at their speed or their velocity of the movement, when they start at dot A, they are at full stop, they are at zero velocity. And then as the movement progresses, as they are drawing the line, the velocity goes up until it reaches a peak around, let's say the middle of the movement. Then they are getting close to point B they start to slow down and eventually stop. Okay, so this is one movement primitive, one single simple movement. And we took this protocol from a Sosnik and colleagues and what they did in a 2004 study, they took participants for 10 days and they gave them to do this task again and again and again and again, many, many times, hours upon hours. And uh, all the participants started with four discrete movements. And what happened eventually is we saw some co-articulation. And co-articulation is another kind of a um, term that we used, which basically means that the movements start to overlap. So instead of being one, uh, like four separate single movements, we start to see the movements come together. Um, and what happens when the movements overlap? Their velocity profiles also start to overlap and there is some kind of superposition. So instead of like starting at zero velocity, going up, going down, stopping at point B, starting again, going up, going down, stopping at point C, we see that participants don't reach a full stop. There are still maybe two discrete peaks but you don't stop at each point. You kind of go through the movements. Um, so this is what uh, we use to define co-articulation. And in Sosnik's experiment, the protocol that we took, after like a ton of, uh, of um, repetitions, participants on, the own, on their own start to co-articulate. It happens to them, but it takes a long, long time. And it's like, I can't believe that they made the participants do this. And we were nicer. So we brought participants into our lab just for one time. And we thought, like, we hoped we can speed their process. So in maybe 30 minutes or 15 minutes, we get them uh, to co-articulate. This was our hope at least. And uh, what did we tell them? So as I said, all subjects, heard the initial instruction, connect the dots as rapidly and accurately as possible. This is kind of the baseline. And then after they did this for like 10, 30, 40 times, we added an additional instruction. The control group never got an additional instruction. The analogy group, we told them to imagine you're painting with a paintbrush and try not to leave paint stains during the drawing. Okay, this is, an, uh, this is the analogy and whatever they understood from it, they understood from it. Then finally, we added a third group. We called it the explicit group. And we told them to draw curved lines without fully stopping on the targets. And this is kind of our version of telling them what we wanted from them explicitly. Uh, and what did we get? So here I want first to show you kind of uh, exemplary uh, participants, one of each group, and then I'm going to talk about the overall results. But I just want to show you how this actually looks when we kind of see what participants did. 
in the in the middle you can see um, a participant from the control group and also noticed all the pretest um, trials look the same basically what participants did is draw four separate lines and uh, you can now think back on when I first showed you the target task and uh, be honest with yourself and ask yourself if you did also like four separate movements making this shape that has corners or maybe you did more of a boomerang shape that is curved. So each of you can uh, think for themselves. But anyway, in our experiment, everyone started off with uh, four separate lines. And the control group remained the same throughout the experiment because it wasn't that long. So if you don't induce any change, participants stay with this strategy. And looking at their velocity profiles, we see indeed four uh, discrete bell-shaped curves. So each time they went all the way down to zero and then started again, each, each uh, target actually. Then looking at the analogy group, we actually saw that uh, they did co-articulate and they started to connect the two movements, let's say from A to B and from B to C. Um, you see that this line is kind of one curved line instead of two uh, lines with an angle. And, uh, and the velocity profile kind of uh, mirrors this result. So we see that they didn't go down to zero. They didn't completely stop at point B and D, but actually this, this person um, co-articulated his velocities, velocity profiles overlap. And not very surprisingly, this was actually also what we saw in the explicit group. They also uh, showed co-articulation um, curved lines and overlapping velocity profiles. So um, ho hopefully this is um, understandable or clear. And now I'm going to show like the overall results of the experiment. So first of all, I just wanted to show here on the left-hand side, a, a simulation that was done also by researchers in Jason, Jason Friedman's lab. And they wanted to see, this is a computer simulation, how would it look like, how would the trial look like if a, a hypothetical participant was co-articulating, overlapping their movements or not. And indeed, what we saw in our participants is very similar to this simulation. Um, and, and what did we see like in the averages of the groups? So we saw that um, this is like, this is the co-articulation measure. How much did people co-articulate? The control group remained the same throughout the experiment. Um, all the groups started at the same point. And then the analogy group, uh, um, improved significantly. They, they improved their core articulation. However, the explicit group actually uh, improved even more. So this was maybe a bit disappointing for me as a research student, but I think it's uh, interesting scientifically. So overall, I got over my disappointment and I am going to talk later what I think this, uh, this can indicate. But before that, I just want to show two more analyses we did. Um, one on the left-hand side is accuracy. We asked our participants to uh, complete the task rapidly and accurately. And we just wanted to check that they are not sacrificing accuracy, like drawing all over the tablet. And, and indeed we see that they remained accurate. So co-articulating or drawing curved lines does not mean that you are less accurate. This is kind of important to show, at least it was important for us. And then the second thing that we were interested in is the movement duration, how rapid were participants completing the task. And here we did see a reduction in movement duration, meaning going out from point A and returning to point A, in general, uh, participants did it um, faster or in less time. Um, yeah. 
And, and you see like the explicit group kind of started out being faster, but we compared each group to itself. So overall, all the groups improved in this measure. Um, all right, so I want to talk a bit about the conclusions from this experiment, and then I'm going to present another experiment. So stay with me. Um, as I said, analogies improved participant score articulation, but explicit instruction did that even more. Um, participants did generate curved movements. Um, performing superposition of movement primitives and participants shortened their movement duration and didn't sacrifice accuracy. What kind of uh, things um, did I kind of conclude or what do I want to discuss um, following these results? So first of all, something I didn't mention, um, but maybe you saw it in the core articulation measure is that there was a certain regression in core articulation in the post-test, as opposed to the training phase. Like core articulation went up and then it a bit fell down, like went down. Um, and we think this might be for two reasons. Either participants were a bit confused about what's going on um, because of like the changing instructions, or they perceived that drawing the curved lines is cheating or maybe it's less accurate, even though they were as accurate when they um, used core articulation as opposed to not, maybe they perceived it as less accurate. So this is kind of one, I don't know, question that I was left with from the study. Another one is that core articulating subjects didn't improve in, in movement duration more than the control group. Okay, so we saw core articulation both in the analogy and in the explicit group, but um, it didn't improve their movement duration as, as uh, compared to the control. Everyone improved their movement duration. So this is kind of an effect maybe of uh, repeating the task many times and getting used to it. And when thinking about the analogy that we used with the paintbrush, it could be that um, the analogy evoked uh, curved lines. So when people think about painting, maybe they think about curved lines, but also about uh, slower movements. They perceive painting as this meditative slow activity and their movement became slower because uh, theoretically, if you think about it, when you co-articulate, and you move at the same speed, you should finish the task faster because you're not dipping into the zero every time and they didn't finish it faster. Um, I mean, they did as, um, like, as opposed to themselves, but not to the control group. So anyway, this is kind of a question of which analogy we chose. And I'll come back to this point in the end of the presentation because I think it's very important. Uh, and finally, when I, I just want to um, talk about the analogy versus explicit groups, and I, I think that in a simple and uh, a task with minimal um, rules, explicit instructions can be sufficient or even preferred. And this is also like a point that uh, I think it's important to make that I think analogies are a great um, tool to use, but maybe it's not an appropriate tool for every context. And we kind of want to be smart about when we use it and when we don't. And I'll also come back to this in the end. Okay, so this was the first experiment we, we did. And I would like to um, talk about a second task that we used. We call it the mirror game. And in this task, I'll show you a video and I'll kind of explain over the video. Basically, there is this red oval moving across the screen. And the participants have a blue oval that they control. And we ask them to uh, synchronize between the blue oval and the red oval, kind of mirroring the red oval with their movements. Um, and in this task, we are interested in a uh, 
seeing how how uh, people are able to synchronize and maybe generate smooth movements. This is what we were interested in, and um, you can see that the velocity of the of the red oval changes throughout the experiment. And actually, when it moves in slower speeds, it's harder to, to uh, maintain the smooth movement. So you can even see the blue oval now. It's moving very slowly and it's kind of jittering. It's going back and forth. It's stopping and starting because this is a hard task. It's not the participant's fault. Uh, and indeed, this is what we were interested in. So we call this jitter. and. Um, and you can see this is an image uh, from another experience in, in our lab that um, when, the, when participants need to move quite fast, they do it fine, their movement is smooth, they are synchronized, they, they mirror the red oval, but when it slows down, their movements have these sub movements, kind of multiple uh, velocity peaks within them. So uh, I want to show you our results, the participants we, we used. And again, first of all, I'm showing you kind of a one participant from the analogy group and one from the control. So the one here on top is from the control group and the one on the bottom is the analogy group. And this is the same trial. They're doing exactly the same movements. And here in the middle of the trial, you can see this is like the lowest velocity movements. And there is a really a noticeable difference. So the analogy participant, he's quite smooth. He's going, he synchronizes, he's kind of mirroring um, the, the red oval. And the control participant, he's a bit all over the place. He's very jittery. You can see multiple peaks for each movement going back and forth. Um, yeah, and it's it's a, it's very visible. Once you see it, you 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 understand what's going on. However, the results are a bit more complicated, so I'll go through them. Basically, um, we we analyze this experiment according to the stimulus frequency. How fast or how how many times was the stimulus going right and left for each kind of um, round? And uh, these were the frequencies we used. Basically, in the higher frequencies, we see that people improve um, throughout the experiment from pretest to protest, protest, post test. <laughs> um, but there is not really a sig significant difference between the groups. So everyone is, is improving. Then, in the lower frequency, um, uh, velocities. So for this one, 0 0.375, the analogy group actually uh, significantly improved, improved significantly more than the control and the explicit group. And the lowest velocity, everyone actually got worse. So their pretest um, jitters were, movements were smoother than their post-test. And what, like what you're seeing here is basically the higher their score here, um, the less corrections they're doing. Okay, so they're improving because they are doing less corrections. Their movement is smoother. Um, and I'm just going to gather the results and the conclusion of this experiment, kind of talk about them. Orian, can I just yeah. ask? What what yeah. the analogy was you used in the in the second experiment? Ah, uh, good question. Yes, I took it out of here for some reason, but actually we used the same analogy. Um, yeah, we didn't want to confuse them, and they were doing both tasks like at the same when they came to us together. So uh, again, we told them to to imagine painting with a paintbrush, and for the explicit group, we told them, we asked them to draw, um, I think we said some, like we said it in Hebrew, so I'm kind of a, a thinking about it in English, but basically we told them to draw continuous lines 
And I think we told them to try not to make corrections. Like we were really explicit with what we wanted. Um, Thanks. And yeah, yeah and, and it's a good question because I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit. Basically, um, just to go over the like general results. So the uh, analogy group had significantly less jitter in this uh, specific frequency, the low but not lowest frequency. Uh, all groups did worse in the 0 0.25 Hertz frequency. Uh, we think this is um, because um, maybe they became fatigued uh, or they didn't have immediate feedback. So going back actually to your question, we told, for instance, the explicit group to not make small corrections, but they didn't have direct feedback of whether they were making these corrections or not. They just saw the blue oval, but they didn't see, let's say, the, the path that it was making and if it had corrections. So we gave them this explicit instruction, but they weren't able to use it for their advantage. And in the lowest frequency, we think that maybe all of them, like all participants, um, just either had fatigue or didn't, like the lack of immediate feedback did not allow them to improve. They actually got worse. Um, and then finally, all groups improved in the higher frequencies, but there were no significant di differences between them. This would be expected because faster movements are easier to perform smoothly and participants gained experience and familiarity with the task. So they didn't have the feedback, but they were getting practiced. Um, all right, are there questions in the chat that I should um, refer to? Um, if we could save them to the end if you want. And, okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so actually we're at the end. And, and I would just kind of like to summarize what I took away from this, uh, these experiments and this research, and also maybe thinking forward to further research and how I would apply this knowledge in more general, yeah, in general. So uh, first of all, I just want to restate that analogies are a fun and creative way to learn and improve skills. So this is already a good reason to uh, use them and to study them. They are diverse and flexible and can be used in various contexts to achieve any number of goals. Uh, so this is already like, I think analogies are a great tool and they can be used in many contexts. And it just, I think, um, it's a good idea to think how we use this tool. In the context of our experiments, we saw that analogies can improve the motor learning process and induce insight into certain aspects of the movement, including change in cognitive representation. So this takes us back to the target task. And we saw that uh, participants started to co-articulate and create these curved lines which they wouldn't do otherwise without the analogy or the explicit instructions. And we think this is kind of an insight into the task and that we, and we can consider that this is maybe a change in cognitive representation. They start thinking differently about the task. And finally, crafting the best analogy can be tricky and applying kinematic research may be helpful. So of course, practitioners like teachers and coaches use analogies all the times and um, that's great. But maybe when we start to use kinematic research, we can gain more insight into what these an analogies are actually doing. We measure how accurate the movement is, what is its duration, what are the dynamics? And, and this cannot really be done without kinematic methodologies. So further research is needed to compare between analogies, like maybe paint with a paintbrush or a different analogy, the balloons, for instance, and also between different groups, such as experts and novices, healthy subjects versus rehabilitation patients and more. 
And I think um, for me, it's, it would be very interesting to take the analogies uh, method into rehabilitation and kind of working with this uh, yeah, context. And finally, uh, in many movement disciplines, analogies are used regularly. And we would like to suggest, or me, um, some things to consider when we are choosing which analogy to use. So first of all, uh, what aspect of the skill does the analogy capture and which aspects does it leave out? In my exper experiment, maybe I was able to capture the curviness or the core articulation, but not really the speed. And if this was a goal of mine, then I had a problem. Uh, another thing to consider is that the imagery invoked should align with the mover's goals. This is kind of, a, again, what I was talking about. And finally, that previous experience, age and cultural background will influence a, the understanding and effectiveness of the analogy. So for instance, I was using this painting analogy um, and my participants actually had very minimal experience with painting. They were not artists. And maybe this affected how they understood what I meant. Uh, and people from different backgrounds or different experience would uh, use this analogy differently. And maybe it would help them more and maybe not because I myself am also not a painter. So I'm kind of using an analogy and, and maybe if I would use it on painters, they would understand it differently and I would have a different problem. So anyway, it's like things to consider. All right, so that's it. That was uh, my research. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it.